right. I always appreciate the way that they serve and give. And I want to be, uh, be one of the first ones to say also welcome back to everybody. This is almost like a homecoming service. Everybody's been everywhere. And so we get to finally be back together. Summertime is over. It's been a full summer too, man. It's been, we've had all of our camps. There's been a lot of trips going on. You might have heard even too, uh, in, uh, in my family, we got to go visit my in-laws in, in South Carolina. And it was a very eventful trip. We got rear-ended on our first day, had to spend the whole day in the hospital to check on the baby, and everybody's, everybody's fine, but that was a good way to start our trip. And then on the way back, we got stuck in New York for a day, so this is, this is the whole crew. We had, to, we had to find a hotel and like shuttle around. We had, like, our hotel was like an hour away from the airport. It was, it was madness. It was very planes, trains, and automobiles. If you want to know the story, I can tell you another time. And then, uh, and then last week, like it was shared, we got the fun of be, being able to enjoy the church camping trip. I don't remember what we kept calling it. It's only like the first reannual or something like that. It had been like 12 years since we've done the camping trip. But it was so much fun to be with everybody. Great fellowship. We had some awesome bonfire worship and s'mores time. Uh, we're looking forward to next year. We want to get even more of the church to make sure that we're, we're there next year. Um, but I've missed everybody. I've kind of missed you guys. We've been in and out of town a lot. And I was like, man, this is crazy. I, I really miss the church and just want to be connected with everybody again. And I know while we were gone, we had our awesome desert trio preaching the word for us. We can give it up for James and Darren and Aaron uh, preaching the word for us when we were gone. But before we finished, uh, we finished the summer... If you guys remember, we did a, we did a great series on grace. That is, uh, as Paul was wrapping up his life, one of the things he told Timothy is, of all things to be strong in, you need to be strong in grace. And as we, as we do a follow-up to our sermon series on grace, and as we're starting the new school year, we're going to be doing a six-week series on the book of Galatians. And uh, some of you guys might have gotten it. We sent out, a, a, the, the Bible Project's got this great, 10-minute breakdown of the book of Galatians. We sent it to all the family group leaders. So if you don't have it, go look it up. It's, it's great material just to get your mind thinking about what Paul was, uh, was writing in this letter. But, uh, you know, a big theme of this book is Paul trying to encourage the church to continue to live by grace. To live the life of a disciple of Jesus. Really, and what, what that is, is the life of a new creation. And so our series for the next six weeks is going to be called A New Creation. And before we get into chapter 1, I'm going to do a really brief history of the, uh, of the book of Galatians here, just to get us even engaged here before we get to chapter 1. There's certain things that we've got to know some history about before it can really uh, take, take shape for us. Uh, but it also helps us know why it was written and how it works for us today, 2,000 years later. Amen? So we're going to say a word of prayer, and we're going to jump right in. Father, I do just want to thank you so much for the opportunity to be together with my brothers and sisters. So grateful for this church and uh, grateful for all the things that you've done throughout the summer, through all the camps, all the conferences, all the, all the crazy things that have been happening and the victory stories from there. And I pray, Father, that, that as, as we get to uh, regain, re, rejoin together for fellowship today, uh, I, I can think of no better way to even kick off the new school year than to be together like this and worship you. Uh, I pray that you help us to engage fully with you in your scriptures here this afternoon. Uh, please speak through me. We love you. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So the TLDR of Galatians. Uh, so Christianity, if we, didn't, if we didn't really put the math together, Christianity under the New Covenant didn't really officially start until Acts chapter 2. Right. So after Jesus ascends, the Holy Spirit comes down, the tongues of fire, they're speaking in tongues, crazy things, right? Peter preaches the first sermon of salvation to a crowd of Jews, all God's people in from all over the world, the known world at the time, at Pentecost. And part of this message is now they are hearing for the first time the Old Testament, their whole way of thinking, their whole old life is no longer how they're going to be living. All of the laws, all the feasts, the festivals, everything that they had known their entire lives, it's now for naught. They're doing something else. They're going to be a part of something different. They're going to be living as disciples of Jesus and following his teachings. 
No more feasts, no more sacrifices, no more circumcision, no more purifying rituals. All the things that come with the Old Testament. But not only was this a message for the Jews, it started with the Jews in Acts chapter 2, but it carried on as the book of Acts goes on that it wasn't just for the Jews, it was for the Gentiles. And if you're not, if you're not familiar with church, the word Gentile gets thrown out there throughout the Bible, and really what it means is it means non-Jews. It means people that were not God's people originally. All right? It's the... It's like the difference of people that have grown up in church and people who have never been to church before ever. And the message of the new covenant was, was now God's people was not just going to be a nation of Israel. It was going to be everybody. Anyone that was not a Jew can now also be God's people. The Greeks, the Romans, the Samaritans. As Colossians 3 verse, 1, verse 11 says, Here there is no Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. The story of the new covenant, the, the message of the new covenant was, was the doors are open for everybody. Thank God for that, right? Because that means like none of us would be there. So what started to happen, though, as the church continued to grow, was that the Jewish Christians we're trying to figure out this whole Christianity thing from their previous life with God under the Old Covenant. And while they were trying to figure this all out, they started spreading this teaching. Not, I don't believe it was malicious. I don't believe there was this, this huge agenda behind it necessarily. But it was this teaching that in order for the Gentile Christians, the ones who weren't Jews before, in order for them to be saved, they had to first become Jews to then become Christians. And specifically what that, mean, that meant is they needed to hold to some of the Old Testament practices, specifically circumcision for the males. That meant that you were God's people. That was a promise that God made to Abraham for his descendants. And so they were enforcing that you had to first be a Jew in order to be a Christian. And this was a huge deal 2,000 years ago. I know right now many of us are like, what the heck, why is this important? We don't really need to be talking about this. This is a big problem. Because I want you to imagine for a second, to understand where they were at, imagine America gets a new government, okay? New rulers, new constitution, with new rules. You think that that transition would just be smooth? No, it would be messy. There'd be a lot of figuring out, like, wait a minute, the, the old constitution was like this, and, and, you know, under the way we used to do things in America was like this. That's what it was like for the Jewish Christians, they're trying to navigate all this, and it was causing a lot of issues. And in Acts chapter 15, there's a council that's put together of all the church leaders to try to figure out what does God want, what, is the te what are we supposed to be teaching in all this? And they realize, okay, we don't, the Gentiles don't need to be Jews first. The decision's made, that doesn't need to happen. But the problem was that this stuff still continued to be taught in the church. And this letter was written mainly to address this, with the goal of trying to pull people back to the truth, a life of grace and a life of crucifixion with Jesus. And this is great for us. This book of the Bible is great for us because we tend to, as disciples, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, get away from grace. All right? We spent eight weeks talking about grace because it's so hard for us to get our heads and our hearts wrapped around grace. We pull ourselves away from a life of crucifixion. Right? We know that we're supposed to, but crucifixion's hard. And we get wrapped up in our old ways of thinking, our old ways of living. We get swept away by distractions in life. We get stuck in our sin again. Sometimes it's new sin, but a lot of times it's just old sin. And we need to be brought back to the gospel of grace and what a life crucified with Jesus needs to look like. So let's turn to chapter 1, and we're going to get into our sermon for today. All right, Galatians chapter 1. All right, starting in verse 1. It says, Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by a man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. 
and all the brothers and sisters with me to the churches in Galatia, grace and peace to you from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. So he starts off with a very, very noticeable Paul-type introduction, right? Grace and peace to you. And then the tone changes a little bit. I'm astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Imagine if I talked like that normally on a Sunday service. Later on in chapter 3, he calls him. He says, you foolish Galatians. Like if I preached like that, I probably wouldn't have a job here for very long. But this is Paul's tone here. But this is why. You're deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let them be under God's curse. And we, as we have already said, and now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than the one you accepted, let them be under God's curse. Am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of Christ. We'll stop there. All right, so Paul comes out swinging. The very beginning of this chapter. Let's, get, let's dig into what he's talking about here because he starts off talking about gospels. I'm sure it's a word you've heard many times. Many times, whether you've been to church your whole life or not. The word gospel shows up a lot. And, uh, and in Galatians, it's one of his favorite, you know, it shows up a lot of, in the book of Galatians. And it's one of Paul's like, favorite words. If you look up how many times gospel shows up in the New Testament, Paul says it like more than anybody by a, a lot. Like four times more than Jesus. But it comes from a Greek word that I'm sure some of you know that means good news. So when he says the word gospel, what he really means is you've been preached, you, you've been hearing the good news, and now he's saying there was this other gospel, this other good news that was making its way into God's people. Now, we got to talk about this for a second, because whenever Jesus used this word, and Jesus was the one that originated the gospel, the preaching of it, he was almost always referring to the fact, he said when, the, when he was preaching the gospel, he was preaching that things were going to be changing. Stuff was going to be different. The kingdom was coming. The Messiah was here. The good news that God was fulfilling his promises. Stuff was going to be different. But it wasn't just news. When he preached about the gospel, he was preaching about a lifestyle. The first thing that Jesus was ever recorded preaching, it shows up in, in I think, all four gospels, but specifically in Mark at the very beginning, it says that he would preach, repent and believe the good news. Repent and believe the gospel. That the news of all this that's coming, it's going to come with a change in you. There's things that you've got to start doing differently. Believing the gospel of Jesus was always meant to be changing our lives to live like Jesus. Amen. Okay? So it's not an intellectual acknowledgement. It's not a feeling. It's not a, wow, that was a great sermon. I'm glad I went to that church for this Sunday. It's it's if you believe the gospel, if you heard the gospel, that meant things in your life were going to start looking more like Jesus. And in chapter 1, Paul goes straight into it, saying that the Galatians were deserting grace, giving it up, putting it aside, rejecting it, and the gospel of Jesus to follow what he called a different gospel. A different kind of good news, which later on he says, which was really no gospel at all. It really wasn't good news. They were abandoning the good news to follow the fake news. All right, that's where we're getting our title today. Good news and fake news. I'm not going to do any Donald Trump references. Just leave it be. We're talking about Jesus today. But I want to roll on this theme of news for a bit here, okay? Because followers of Jesus live by the good news, right? That's what we're supposed to do. Not fake news. But we are a country that is filled with news. We got lots of news. You know, I didn't used to like the news. When I was younger, I didn't care for it at all. It was boring. I didn't understand why my dad wanted to sit and watch it every night. But as I've gotten older, I find myself going, man, I want to know what's happening. I want to, be, I want to know what society is, is, what's happening in the world. 
You know, we have so many, so much access to so much news all over the place. It's easy. With social media and smartphones, stuff gets around pretty quickly, doesn't it? And really, the truth is, we love this as people. We love that there's so much news around us. Humans are gluttons for gossip. I mean, is there anything more tasty sounding than, have you heard? There's a part of our nature that just even when I said that, you're like, ooh, he's got something to say. I want to know, I want to know what this is about. I want to know what's happening. And this, this filters into all kinds of different things, right? We love being the first to know something. Like even that person, we're like, so like, oh, hey, did you hear? Did you hear about what happened in Russia? Yeah, yeah, I read that two days ago. Totally in the know. Got everything that's going on right now. I get the notifications on my ESPN app whenever so-and-so gets hurt, you know? We love that stuff. Did you hear, did you hear about, about FaceApp and that the Russians are taking your pictures and they're geo-tracking you? So the Russians are in your, are in your phone because of you wanting to look like an old person in this picture? Did, did nobody hear that article? Did nobody read about that? Yeah, we all bought into that, right? Like, the Russians are in my phone because of this picture app. You know, sometimes we don't even read the articles. We just read the headlines. Is anybody guilty of that? You just, you just skip the whole article and just go, whatever the headline is, I'm going to ask them if they know about it. But also, man, we, as a culture, we look for something to be outraged about. We're looking to be upset. We want to be upset by stuff. We've got to talk about it on social media. There's a lot of news coming at, of, coming at us. And a lot of it is fake, and a lot of it is biased. There's articles, there's documentaries, there's TED Talks, there's podcasts. There's so many ways for us to get news. And we've got to sift through the junk to find what's good and what's fake. And the same goes for the way that we live our lives. And the same goes for our faith and our walk with God. Satan wants to water down the gospel. He doesn't want us living by the gospel of Christ. He wants to make it some murky, muddy, shallow version of what it's supposed to be. And that's what Paul is addressing in this chapter, is that the, the gospel was being muddied. It was being watered down. It was being confused with fake news. And just like real news, we got to know how to, how to sort through this stuff to find the truth. So i got three short points for us. Number one, with any news, you got to check the source. You know, oftentimes we're quick to, quick to believe a headline because it sounds interesting or scandalous without checking the sources. Like, how many of us actually research the articles that we read to see how true it is or not? Who's got time for that? <laughs> you just hope that the source, that, that what, you are, what you read was true enough, right? Um, how many, well, let me, this is an even better question. How many of us have posted an article or said something like, hey, did you hear about this? This true thing happened to find out the whole thing was fake. How many of us have been guilty of it? Raise your hands. Oh, you guys, are not, you guys aren't being honest here. There have been plenty of times. There have been some of you that I know you guys have because I've read the articles. You know, you guys have heard of, you guys have heard of uh, Babylon Bee before? Yeah. It's a website. It's a, it's a um, it's, it, what is it? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a satirical website about Christianity things. I've, had, I've seen people post articles from there as like, this is fact and this is true, not getting that the whole thing is a joke. You know, the, there's a website called The Onion. It's the same thing. A lot of articles get posted there saying like, man, did you hear about this? You're like, it's completely fake. I've been guilty of it before. I'm going to be honest. It's okay. I'm not scared of you. <laughs> I've got no pride in this game right now, okay? But Paul tells the church here in Galatia, that they are listening to a false gospel. That they're listening to a gospel from people that are trying to please the crowds. Because a lot of the Jews weren't ready to give up Judaism yet. They weren't ready to give up their version of God. And they were pressuring people to believe, to believe what they were saying for their own agenda. And Paul reminds them that the gospel he preached to them, it didn't, it didn't come from peer pressure. It didn't come from, I heard this from so-and-so who heard from so-and-so. Paul said, look, the gospel that I preached to you, it came from God. It came from the mouth of Jesus. I'm not in this to win your approval. I'm here just to preach the truth to you. I'm trying to pull you back to, to grace and to Christ. 
He even doubles down, as you might have noticed there in verse 8 and 9. He says, matter of fact, if me, if an angel, if anybody else comes to you to preach a gospel other than the one we preached, they should be eternally condemned. Because it's not real news. It's a lie. And this, is, this brings up a great question for us to consider for ourselves. What is the source behind the gospel of your life? When we say gospel, we're talking about the way we choose to live our life. What is the source of your gospel, of the way you live? What leads you to make your decisions in life? When it comes to your job, your finances, your school, your future, your health, the way you raise your kids, anything that's important in your life, where's your source? Does it come from the truth? or somewhere else. And with all that's available for us today, there are a lot of places you can get Gospels from. You know, if, if you want to believe that the earth is flat, it doesn't take you very long to go find a lot of people that will support your theory. Even now, right? Flat earthers can be weird people. They need Jesus, though. Okay? And really, this speaks to something in us, because sometimes... The gospel that we want to follow, we want to find things that fit our narrative. Yep. We're looking for things that tell us what we want to hear for how we want to live our own life. Paul warns about this in 2 Timothy. He said, look, many, many are going to come to you and preach a lot of different things. They're going to say things that your itching ears want to hear. We want gospels that, suit, that, that, that allow me to explore Jesus and do what I want. I want, I want the benefits of Jesus without the commitment of Jesus. I want the relationships without sharing my faith. I want the things that, that give me what I want from God. And we can chase it through friends. We can get our sources from family, from YouTubers, from celebrities, from news channels. And the list just goes on and on and on. And the hole is so deep there. And we can even get it from each other at church. Sometimes the source of how we live our life is just each other. And you know, I love this church. And I believe we are fighting to teach and live by the truth. But I don't want you to believe things just because I say it, because I'm up here. I'm not here to be your source. And neither is anybody else here. You know, Matthew 15, Jesus talks about this. He says, you, hypoc you hypocrites, when he's talking to uh, the Pharisees, Isaiah was right about you when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain because their teachings are merely human rules. Jesus warns about this. He said, look, you're not supposed to be living your life based on what somebody told you. You could be, you could be saying the right things. You could be looking the right way and be as far from God as possible. Because you're not living your life by the source, by the truth. And when we move away from the Bible, when we move away from the gospel of Christ, we can easily be led away from God without realizing it. Point number two, follow the evidence. You know, I got my degree in exercise science and kinesiology. And one of the big things that in, in my degree that we would talk about were gimmicks in the health and fitness world. There's a lot of them. There's new ones every year, right? And, and a lot of it, too, is our teacher was trying to put it in as to practice what you preach. Because if you're going to work in this kind of field, you want to make sure that you're living in a healthy way. Because nobody wants to take health advice from somebody that's unhealthy. Right? Right? Is the guy that you want to talk, that you want to get your diet and your workout plan from, do you want that guy to be heavier than you? No, you want him to be healthy. And so we would talk about stuff like be wary, be wary of quick fixes, of diets that get you skinny in two weeks, and workout plans. All you got to do is spend three easy payments of $485 for this piece of equipment, and you're going to get rock hard abs. <laughs> be wary of this stuff. Do your research, but also look at the life of the people that are doing this stuff. 
Look at the way they live. You know, I love Dwayne Johnson, but he's not realistic. This dude has a team of people putting his meals together. He has a traveling workout gym that he takes on set with him. This dude is working out constantly. His whole day is like managed by the minute. If I, if I want to be healthy, that's not, I can't follow that. There's nothing about that life that's realistic for me. But there is a guy that we would talk about a lot in college. You guys, does anybody know who this is? Jack LaLanne. This guy was like one of the original fitness gurus. This dude was working out into his 90s. And he wasn't doing special gimmicky things, man. He was doing push-ups. He was doing body squats. And this dude was in great shape. There's all these pictures of him in his 90s, his frail little body with biceps. It's crazy. He lived to like 96. He was super healthy. Jack Lane is awesome, because you know what? When I'm in my 60s, I would love to look like that. And you know what? That's realistic. You know, in his efforts to turn the church back to the good news, Paul refers to his own story. Through the rest of the chapter, after what we just read, and into chapter 2, he reminds them of his life and his background, and how God transformed his life. Specifically in verse 13 and 14, I'll read it real quick. It says, for you've heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my father. So he brings up his own history and says, look, guys, I get it. I get why you're struggling with, with, this, with giving this stuff up. I did it. I did all of it. I was the Jew of Jews. I was the guy. I did all the feasts, I did all the festivals, I did all the rituals. I've done it all, I've been there. But look at what God has transformed me into. Look at what it's, look at the evidence. He's saying, look, just, don't just believe my lip service, don't, don't just listen to my words, look at my life. When you saw how I used to be, look what happened once the gospel of Jesus transformed me. It changed everything. Following Jesus, it works. It's not a gimmick. It's not a once a week Sunday clock in thing. It changes your life when you give it. You know, one of the awesome things about following the gospel of Jesus is that we get to be surrounded by people in various stages of life who are living it out as well. We always need first to go to the source for truth. Right? We're clear on that. Before, before even talking to other people and getting advice, we want to make sure that we're clear on what the Bible teaches and what is true there. But on top of that, we also get to see the evidence of what happens when people really live this out in their life. How it affects the things that matter. How it affects the areas of their life. Like, what are people that are living according to the gospel of Jesus, how does it affect their education, their finances, their careers, their relationships, their parenting, the stuff that we all care about, we get to see the evidence when we're really doing it. And what I love about this church is we've got so many great examples here of disciples that are living by the gospel that we get to utilize. You know, in Hebrews 13, it says, Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. What the Hebrew writer is saying here, he says, look, I want you to look around you. Look around you at the godly men and women that are in your life, the ones that are really given over to the gospel of Jesus. And I want you to consider, man, who are the people in here that have a marriage that I respect? Who are the people that have, that have, that have done a great job parenting their kids? Who are the people that made it out of high school with as little damage to their life as possible? Who are the people that are, that are godly in their finances and their choices in their life like that? And how can I learn from them? He says, don't just, he says, consider it. Consider the outcome. Look at the evidence. Look at how the gospel, if they're really following it out, you'll see the evidence but consider it, he says, and then imitate them. Imitate their faith. 
When I think about who I am today, I am not the product of just God working on me solely in a room somewhere with just him and me. My marriage is the product of great marriages that have gone before me. My parenting is the product of great parents that have gone before me. My faith, my ability to be a disciple, I just hit 18 years as a Christian this last Sunday. My ability to be faithful has not been just just me and God by myself. It's God working through the people in my life, giving me people to imitate that I can watch how the gospel plays out in my life. God wants us to look at these things. The gospel works when you do it. And you don't have to just buy what I'm selling. Look around you and look at the people that that are living it. Last but not least, trim the fat. You know, when you're writing an article, you're supposed to cut down the fluff. Get to the good stuff. With anything significant in life, we want to get to the good stuff. What's really important? I don't know about you, but I have a limit to how long of an article I'm willing to read. And if, and if it's a good article, I'll just skip, maybe I can skip a few paragraphs here and kind of get down to the stuff that I'm really looking for, right? Some of you guys may even be thinking that about my sermon, and shame on you. <laughs> like, get to the good, what are you trying to get to, Jake? Cut the fat. Let's do this. All right? The issue that Paul was addressing with the Jewish Christians is not a unique problem to us. The whole, the whole life they had lived, their whole life they had lived by a certain gospel. And it wasn't wrong. It was actually something that God wanted. It was, it was something that honored God. They were God's peoples. There were feasts to eat, rules to follow. There was a lot about the Old Testament, you know, that's very empirical. It's dutiful. It's things that you can, you can kind of wrap your brain around or things that you can do knowing, okay, God wants me to do this. And there's a part of us that likes that as humans, right? Kind of like, like, I don't know if anybody, like when you finished college, you kind of went to that, oh, I have nothing else ahead of me that I have to do. And there's a layer of insecurity that I feel about that. Like, there's not like a clear next step. And now that they were following Jesus, all that was gone. Their whole history, like that. They were learning a new way of thinking about their relationship with God. They were now, faith, hope, and love were the premiums, not just following the old laws. They weren't the only ones that were God's people anymore. Now they had to start liking and loving the Romans, who were their enemies. They had to start liking the Samaritans, who were the half-breeds. They were supposed to be making disciples. The Jews never did that before. They didn't have to preach the word to people. They they weren't trying to bring people to Jesus. They just were God's people. And that alone was proclamation. There was a lot about this new life that was uncomfortable. It was insecure. Their whole identity was shaken. Imagine if I came to you next week at church and we were like, okay, no more Christmas, no more Thanksgiving, no more church on Sundays because God says so. There's something better he wants us to do. You probably wouldn't like what I was saying. Wait, I don't get Christmas anymore? I have boxes of things in my garage that are just dedicated to to Christmas. My wife would be so upset. You know, I believe most of them were trying to, what, what they were trying to do with their struggle here was that they were trying to take the things of their old life that they thought were good and that were a little bit more secure to them And they were trying to merge them with Christianity. They wanted the secure things of their old life to merge with the uncertain things of their new life. And before we were all Christians, if you're a disciple of Jesus in this room, all of us were following other gospels. We were living our lives by some other form of good news. We're looking for purpose, looking for for ways to live our lives that make sense, that that, that are empirical, and that would keep us from going crazy in a dark world. Because the truth of the matter is, if you don't have a gospel to live by, if you don't have something to hold on to, you start to go crazy when you look at the state of the world. Right? We can't survive in it. And really, the truth is that God made us to desire something. 
He made us to follow. He made us to want to live for some kind of purpose. I'm going to bring out some stuff here because i got some fun practical things for us today. i got props. i got props that all represent something. Each of these represents a different type of gospel that, sometimes, that, that we can live our lives by or that we can follow. And we can do more gospels than one. This is going to represent relationships. It's something to cuddle. Okay? That before Jesus, we're looking for something. We're looking for friendships. We're looking for love. We're looking for romance. We're looking for something to make us not feel alone. Right? We're looking for achievement. This is actually my high school letterman's jacket and my Spartan Beast medal. We live our lives by the gospel of achievement. Looking for it at work, at school, in athletics. Something to make me feel like I'm accomplishing something. Got a neck pillow here for the gospel of comfort. That all of us... Look, okay, that's going to mess with my microphone. I'm not putting that on. Um, that... There's always a part of us, man, we, we want to be able to enjoy life. You know, I'm sure many of you guys are looking forward to when you get home tonight. Sunday nights, man, that's comfort time. My couch, my couch is, the most, is the most amazing place on Sunday night. We look for it in an education, the gospel of education. Sorry, I grab my backpack. Man, if I have the right degrees, if I have the right future ahead of me, then I'm going to feel good about life. What else do I got here? The gospel of social justice. Looking for a cause to fight for. Looking for something to give your energy, something that seems like it's got, it's got lifelong purpose to it. The gospel of financial security. That, that if, if, if my finances are in order, if I can retire by the time I'm 50, then, then my life will be what it's supposed to be. Got the gospel of materialism. This is my Panera bag. <laughs> Chasing clothes, stuff, new iPhones, new whatever to try to make us feel like, 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 like we're, we're with the times. We, we, we can enjoy the things that life has to offer. And then last but not least, the gospel of self. Okay. This is the best I could do. I really tried. The gospel of self that comes with self-improvement. Trusting our own feelings, thoughts, indulgences, wisdom. Oh, I also forgot the God of approval. Where's that? The, the gospel of approval. Here it is. It's going on vacation so we can take pictures to show everybody how great my vacation was. So I can tell people that I'm worth something. And none of these things, none of these things by themselves are bad or wrong. But when our time, our energy, our decisions are being made around these gospels and not Jesus, we're living by a lie. And I've got a little demonstration for us here. Connor, can you come on up here? Connor's my guinea pig today. Connor's going to represent us when we became Christians, okay? And when we became Christians, we knew we're supposed to live by faith and not by sight, right? We're supposed to follow the word and obey it. And I'm going to represent the Holy Spirit because the Spirit is going to lead us. No, 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 you got to come with me. You're not, leading, you're not being led by the Spirit. The Spirit is going to lead us by faith and not by sight. Right? <laughs> Stay right there. <laughs> uh, let me see. Here. Nope. We'll do this. When we become Christians... We knew that we were putting away these Gospels. Luke 9, Luke 14 told us, to said, man, I'm putting away my old self. I'm giving up this old life. I'm putting aside these, these fake Gospels that won't satisfy 
to follow something better. And when we first become Christians, it might be as scary at first. Step, 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 step. Don't fall. Don't fall. <laughs> but it's pretty easy to go along with God at first. But then what starts to happen is the insecurity of following God without something clear in front of us sometimes can make us feel like, you know what? Put this on. I should bring back the gospel of achievement. Because it made me feel a little bit more secure. You know what? I, I really miss the gospel of comfort. You see where this is going. You know, the gospel of relationships... made me feel like I had more value. The gospel of approval, got to hold that with your Bible, was very important too. The gospel of financial security. You know, I still have some things I still feel really passionate about. I definitely know that after years of being a Christian, I got some wisdom to me and know how to run my own life. And then as God tries to lead us around things, it can be a little bit harder to hang on. And then what eventually happens is we're stuck without the gospel. We're stuck without Jesus again. And we're right back to the ridiculous version of ourself that we were before. This is what the Jewish Christians were struggling with in the book of Galatians. Go ahead and stay here. <laughs> here you can smile for everybody, though. <laughs> and what Paul was trying to urge the church to do was what the Hebrew writer said in, in chapter 12. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. I don't know what that is. Oh, well. We're going to keep going. What Paul was trying to remind the church in Galatia to do is, don't forget the real gospel. Don't forget that grace is really what everything is rooted in. Don't forget that the life of crucifixion and following Jesus, it's not about all this stuff, the stuff that you left behind. And the Hebrew writer here is trying to remind us, look, when we're trying to live for Jesus, oftentimes we've got to trim the fat. Oh, I forgot to give him materialism. It's okay, we're done. We've got to remember that it's not about us. You've got to remember that relationships not founded in the gospel, they don't last. They don't work. You've got to remember that financial security, it's a very biblical concept, but it's not how God called us to live our life. The social justice, there's a lot of purposes out there, but the purpose of helping people to know Jesus is bigger than anything. I don't have much to say about approval other than it's a very shallow and empty way to live our lives. Achievement, you know, it can be fun while it lasts, but eventually you put it in a closet and you forget about it for 15 years. And there will always be another Spartan race to run. And lastly, obviously, you remember, where's the tiara? Did you take it off? You took it off. I took it off? Okay, anyways. That when it boils down to it, life is not supposed to be about us. I left several things down here, but you guys get the point. That this stuff might not be directly sinful, but it can hinder. That it can disrupt the race that we were meant to run for. You can take this off. Let's give Connor a round of applause. Let's go.
Paul is trying to remind us all. If you're not a disciple of Jesus, if you've not ever studied the Bible to give yourself over to the gospel of Jesus, he's trying to show you, look, most of the gospels that are out there that you're going to hear, they're fake. They're not real. They're going to leave you disappointed, hurt, damaged, and they're going to lead you away from the truth. If you are a disciple of Jesus, he's trying to remind you, look, my purpose for you, Jesus' purpose for you is not to be a Christian and then bring back all your old life with you so that you can be a Christian with everything again. It's to remember that that's not why we're here. And so the question that all of us have to ask ourselves is, are we living by the good news or are we living by the fake news? When we look at our life now, when we look at what consumes our energy, our thoughts, our heart space, our time, is it the gospel or is it something that's no gospel at all? And so as we get into this, the urgency of Paul here is to pull people back to grace. We are here because God sent Jesus to die for us even though we don't deserve it. But we're supposed to live a life that's been crucified. And if we've forgotten that, if, if we started putting this stuff back on again, it's time to take it off, throw off the stuff that hinders Amen. to run the race that Jesus marked out for you. We're going to say a word of prayer here. And we're going to be dismissed for church today. But I want to urge you, please, if you are visiting with us, we're so glad to have you. And I, want, and I hope that you will talk to somebody that invited you out and talk about studying the Bible, to look at what, what does it mean to really take ownership of the gospel. If you are a disciple, don't dismiss this as, as, as just another Sunday sermon. Come on. As we're starting off the new school year and all the things that are in front of us with the fall, let's do some heart check to evaluate, okay, what, what gospel have I been following? And if it's not been Jesus, let's get it back on straight. Amen. Let's say a word of prayer. Father, I just want to thank you so much that we get the chance right now to just do a heart check. I know that that was Paul's heart. He wasn't trying to condemn the Galatians. He was trying to stir in them to remember what they were called to do. And I pray, Father, that we will remember the grace that has been poured out on us. And I pray, Father, that, that as, we, as we remember the gospel, the, the fake gospels that we left behind when we started following Jesus, God, that if we started putting them back on, that we'll throw them off again. I pray that we will run the race that you've marked out for us. That you will strengthen this church to be what you designed it to be. And we love you, and it's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we're dismissed. Love you guys.